So we have uh, Nicola Chester and Robert McDowell, Cobbit in Conversation, from Rural Rides to Nature Writing. And here is Cobbit. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and I apologise for being a little late. I came in from the Channel Islands today to Southampton, and it would, I would probably be quicker getting one of Cobbit's horses than the, than the plane and the train, but we'll... So thank you for, thank you for, for uh, bearing with me. Um, I actually have a couple in William Cobbett's Rural Rides here. Um, you can get them on, uh, on Amazon for a couple of pence now, but uh, uh, it's, um, it, it's, still a, it's, it, it, it's available still in publication. And um, yes, he has quite a few admirers. Um, let, let me first of all look at the paper, and I've entitled it a 21st century evaluation of rural rides portrayal of English agriculture and country. And as Ollie said, this paper follows on from a paper I presented at the Folklore Society Conference in April of this year, where, where I presented a paper called 21st Century Reevaluation of William Cobbett's Rural Rides. This paper itself differs, uh, uh, differs because it focuses exclusively on agriculture and the countryside. I would hope and indeed anticipate that some of the thoughts and ideas and issues which I raised today may stimulate research and funding opportunities for the Centre for Rural Studies and the highly regarded agricultural faculty at this university, because as I will talk about during my paper, um, uh, without getting into the politics of Brexit, uh, the UK will have to formulate its own agricultural policy on the basis it leaves the EU. But as I say, maybe I'd love to come back and discuss that another time. <laughs> um, a bit of background about William Cobbett. He was an English journalist, farmer and MP born in Farnham, not too far from in Surrey. He believed that reforming Parliament and abolishing the boroughs would help end the, the poverty of farm labourers. They attacked the borough mongers, the sinecurists, and tax eaters, as he called them, relentlessly. He was also against the Corn Laws, tax on imported grain. Early in his career, he was a loyal supporter of the king and country, but later he joined and successfully uh, pub publicised a radical, uh, a radical movement, which led to the 1832 Electoral Reform Bill. And he was elected in 1832 as one of the two MPs to the newly enfranchised Northern Borough of Oldham. You see, although he was not a Roman Catholic, he became a forceful advocate of Catholic emancipation in Britain. Uh, through the seeming contradictions in his life, his opposition to authority was incessant. He wrote many polemics on subjects from political reform to religion, but is best known for this book, Rural Rise, which is the subject of this paper. Um, at the time of writing in early 1820s, Cobbett was a radical anti-corn law campaigner. New returned from England from a spell of self-imposed political exile in the United States. Cobbett disapproved of proposals for remedies of agricultural distress suggested in parliamentary legislation in 1821. He made up his mind to see the rural conditions for himself and to enforce by actual observation of rural conditions the state of agriculture in southeast England. And he made this in answers to the arguments of the landlords before the Parliamentary Agriculture Commission, which were held during the 1820s. He embarked on a series of journeys by horseback to the countryside of South East England and, and the Lower Midlands. He wrote down what he saw from the, from the point of view of both farmers and social reformers. The results docu document the early 19th century countryside and its people, as well as giving free vent to Cobbett's opinions, which were very many. He's now, as I say, he's now virtually synonymous with rural rides, and the, the work first appeared in serial form in the political register, often the history off at the back of the paper, I'm not sure why. At the time of its circulation, it had been greatly diminished by the six acts. This was legislation that the uh, government of the 1820s introduced to gag radical papers, prevent large meetings, and reduce the possibility of armed insurrection. This, of course, is around the time of the Peterloo riots and so on, which I think have just been put into a, into a film. Um, his tour of southeastern counties uh, followed the disintegration of meta metropolitan radicalism at the end of the Queen Caroline affair, and, his bank and he, he was also made bankrupt. Uh, having lost his farm at Botley in Hampshire, um, the family that lived in reduced circumstances at the age of the Great Wen, his term for London, in Kensington, a small uh, village outside London, the extensive estates were replaced by a four-acre seed farm. 
While this change, this change signaled the end of Cobbett's large-scale farming ambition, it also sent him out on the road where he would produce an unrivaled portrait of rural England in the early decades of the 19th century. Let me start by making some observations on rural rides before we focus on agriculture and the countryside. Rural rides, I think, can be seen at so many levels and from so many perspectives. The book is a well-documented tour of South East England, a decade before railway mania started to connect South East England more closely to London. The book is, in my view, picaresque in style and structure. There is no plot. The work is autobiographical. The language has plainness. The satire is frequently employed. Those features are from the lower social classes. Rural Rides is an excellent physical ge geographic reference of South East England at the time. The description of ag countryside, the agricultural practices, uh, physical geography uh, and uh, small towns and the quality of housing are graphic and detailed. Some interesting pen portraits emerge of a range of characters, farmers, labourers, publicans, and small business owners. Rather, in my view, in the manner of the novels of uh, Fielding and Smollett in the 18th century, but perhaps with less comical colouring. So I move to the theme of English agriculture in the countryside. I meant specifically that the, the vast majority of rural rides reflects journeys in South England, South, in the South of England though some later journeys were undertaken to the Midlands and the north of England, where he states about his journey to, uh, to Lees, as to the land viewed in many ways in the way of agriculture, it does not, it seems, seems to have very little worth. I've not seen any uh, good land except at Harewood and Ripley. Uh, all put together, uh, I would not make one half of, uh, of, uh, of what I have seen in many single rickyards in the Vale of Wiltshire, so he obviously didn't like industrialised uh, north of England. East Anglia, in fact where I come from, probably the most profitable area for agriculture in the late 18th and early 19th century, as it is now, was omitted completely. Cobbett planned his travels with the express purpose of finding out the state of the countryside and to use the facts, as I said before, for material for his articles for the political register, uh, to further the cause of political and financial reform. Uh, let's look at the themes of English agriculture countryside, which I think resonate today very much as they did uh, in his time. And I, I, I can only pick three or four out at, at, uh, from each theme at leisure. Uh, I'll talk briefly about agriculture, uh, farming models, corn laws, protectionism, free trade, well that certainly resonates now, uh, and diet, and then I'll, I'll talk about the countryside. Um, Cobbett always maintained there's an active interest, he, he always had maintained an active interest in he appreciated the benefits of the agri agrarian revolution of the 18th century. The crop rotation, soil improvements helped landlord, tenant, and labourer. He was, he was enthused more about the benefits of grains, maize, uh, oats, wheat, and barley than he did of potatoes because of the value weight for weight. The Irish potato famine, albeit posthumously, graphically demonstrated some of his views. Cobbett's notion that farming was supported by a series of mutually beneficial relationships between landlord, tenant and labour, had started to break down uh, in the decade after the Napoleonic Wars. There were increasing profits to be made by selling agricultural products to new, new growing industrial uh, urban population, which made landlords review what had been really lifestyle models of farming and move towards commercial models. And I suppose we, we actually have, again have that sort of tension today, I think, in the post-Brexit uh, uh, environment for agriculture, but again, uh, I mustn't get onto that uh, today. <laughs> again today, uh, in part as a result of the assessment of uh, farming, I say, farming is unlikely to retain the universal subsidies from which it benefited uh, since the uh, 1970s. The role of farmers as, as food producers versus trustees of the countryside and so on will be debated. It's essentially to get the balance between food production and trustees of the land correct. And again, in my view, the Centre for Folk Life and Rural Studies and the Agricultural Faculty at Reading University should be at the forefront of research and advice on this. I echo that yet again, that's sorry. Um, let's briefly turn to Corn Law's protectionism and free trade. Farmers have become increasingly unaware of the changes going on around them, according to Cobbett. And in his first journey, he describes this sense of unknown as the fog 
that was engulfing the countryside and stripping labourers of their foundations from the countryside and into, moving into the smog and inhuman conditions of the factories within the industrial cities. This, this was brought upon by the Corn Laws. These laws were important tariffs to protect the price of corn in the United Kingdom. This stopped free trade between nations, but was seen as a way to enrich landowners and the government. But this was not the case for the farmers and, and labourers, particularly the small farmers. Increased competition meant the farmer had to cut prices to increase demand, but at the same time were making an increased loss due to the taxes they had to pay to their landowners. The, the price of, re, of, of wheat reads like, a, in, in the book, reads like an extensive commodity market commentary uh, throughout the rural rise. He frequently compares the prices of wheat uh, over the years, uh, they were going up the whole time. Again, uh, I, I, I state that uh, the UK is undergoing a bout of self-assessment self on, these, on these issues, and I, I suspect that the debate will mirror in the 21st century much of what Cobbett, Cobbett said. Let's finally talk, move to diet. And diet is an important thing, issue today. Um, William Cobbett frequently inquires of and refers to the diet of those he meets on his journey. He wrote another book, Cottage Economy, published in 1821 with a twofold aim. First, to promote his personal philosophy of self-sufficiency, which he viewed as a foundation of family happiness. And some people uh, see that uh, today as well. And secondly, to instruct the country labourer in the arts of brewing, beer, making bread, keeping cows, pigs, bees, ewes, poultry, rabbits, and other matters. Self-sufficiency and self-sustenance uh, at a time of high grain prices was for Cobbett one of the ways of shielding small farmers and labourers from the pressures of high food prices. He makes frequent observations on, veg on the vegetables and vegetables grown in small holding and gardens. Equally, he, he makes many observations about the way they raise, they raise pigs. You could call it a sort of digestive farmer's weekly, I suppose. <laughs> now, let me talk briefly now about the countryside. I'm going to cover three themes. The Great Way in London industrialisation, and their rural landscape and uh, description, and then uh, uh, come to a few conclusions and uh, hand over to, to Nicola. Let's talk about the Great Wen. As I said, the Great Wen is a disparaging nickname for London. The term was coined by William Cobbett, who saw himself as a champion of rural England. Cobbett saw the rapidly growing city as a poison swelling on the face <coughs> of the nation. The term is quoted in Rural Rides, but what is, what, what is to the fate of the Great Wen, the monster called by the silly coxcombs of the press, the metropolis of the empire? He was very much against London. <coughs> London continues to receive brickbats, although not, in not so robust language, uh, uh, from critics. London sucks in and maintains excessive resources. Uh, it is a different world. Well, I suppose it is today, certainly inside the M25, it is a more multinational than the remainder of the UK. Many would assert that London has a distinct and different economy and de economic model because of its financial services industry, <coughs> as well as the presence of many multinational company headquarters or European headquarters. So, you know, in uh, London, it, if, you, if you take Cobbett's observations into the 21st century, they do, they do resonate, I think. Let's talk briefly about industrialisation. For Cobbett, there was a direct correlation between the expansion of the industrial economy in England's towns and cities and the decline in the countryside. And I quote, uh, the country people lose part of their natural employ. The women and children who ought to provide a greater part of uh, the raiment have nothing to do. The fields must have men and boys. But, but where there are men and boys, there will be no women. Uh, and as the lords of the loom, uh, the uh, great industrial, have now a set of real slaves by, by means of whom they take away part of great employment and country women and girls, uh, they must be kept on poor rates to whatever degree uh, they lose employment uh, through the lords of the loom. So what, he, what, what he's saying is that um, in fact industrialisation actually made more people dependent on, um, on uh, 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 public, public subsidy, which was really, really the poor rate at the time. Industrialisation, albeit in forms of service ind industries concentrated in areas where skilled concentrate, continue to denude the countryside of people and skills, and there are many examples, in particular of younger people. 
the demographics of the countryside are skewed by being seen as a place of retirement. Uh, retirement and the increase of, uh, of second homos have provided uh, some uh, respite, I suppose, but also create other socio-economic problems for, uh, for the countryside and villages. He speaks also about the decline of the countryside. The phenomenon is a corollary of the industrialization, and um, again, he, he elaborates quite a lot on a, statistically on the, uh, on, on the, uh, the costs of, t of t the taxes, agriculture, and the skew towards industrialization directly in his view as a result of the Napoleonic Wars and its aftermath. This turns to something perhaps less controversial now. Uh, we shouldn't ignore the richness and depth of Hobbit's description of the countryside. He lets his preference, however, for the form of countryside uh, show, show through. Let me give you, first of all, a graphic description of the countryside in autumn. And this is a, a place called Chilworth on a, on a, on a Friday uh, evening in, uh, in October. 1821. It's been a very fine day today. Yesterday morning there was snow, believe it or not, on Rygate Hill, enough to look white from where we were in the valley. We set off about half past one o'clock and came all down the valley through Buckland, Betchworth, Dorkingshire and Albury to this place, Chilworth. Very few prettier rides in England and the weather beautifully fine. There are more meeting houses than churches in this valley. And I've heard that no less than five people in this film have gone crazy on account of religion. <laughs> um, yes. Um, but tomorrow we intend to move on towards the west to take a look, just a look at uh, the Hampshire uh, Parsons. Uh, uh, again, the, 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 there's a parson and a big, uh, a big um, farm, believe it or not. The turnips seem fine. Uh, they cannot be cannot be large. All other things are very fine indeed, except perhaps to pro prog prognosticate a hard winter. All the country people say that it will be so. By co contrast, let me provide you a description of a late summer ride from Tenterden in Kent to Appledore, which borders Romney Marsh. From Tenterden, I set off at five o'clock and got to Appledore after a most delightful ride. The, the high land upon my right and the low land on my left. But the fog was so thick and white along the lowland that I would have taken it for, for water if the trees on the hills had not, uh, had not risen up through, through it and been here and there. Indeed, the view was very my, much like those which are presented in the deep valleys near the great rivers of uh, New Brunswick, uh, North America, where, as I said, he had been uh, for a number of years in the early 1800s. Uh, and he comes at uh, the, the stones that melt in spring and then sailing over those valleys. Um, a fog which, t which um, with the tops of the trees rising, though, is very much like this, and such a fog that I saw this morning on my ride to Appledore. And again, comments on the church. The church at Appledore is very large, big enough to hold 3,000 people in the cathedral, I think. <laughs> and the place uh, does not seem to contain half a thousand old enough to, uh, to go to church. And I can, having myself visited uh, Appleton, I can testify that that observation is correct. Well, I wouldn't have, the church is big, but I don't think it holds uh, 3,000 people. Um, another interesting description of the veil between Far Farnham and Alton. The finest 10 miles in England. Here is a river with fine meadows on each side of it and with, with rising grounds on each, each, on each outside of the meadows, those grounds having some hop gardens and some pretty woods. But though I was born in this vale, I must confess that the 10 miles between Maidstone and Tunbridge, which Kentish folk call the Garden of Eden, is a great deal finer. I have to say now it's become a flood plain with houses which floods frequently, but uh, that digresses. Um, uh, for the, for for there, in, this is in, in the, in the uh, ten miles between Maidstone and Tunbridge, uh, there with a river three times as big and a vale three times as broad, not only up garden with beautiful woods, but immense orchards of apples, pears, plums, cherries, filberts, and, and these in many cases with gooseberries, currants, and raspberries beneath. And all taken together, this vale is really worthy of the appellation which it bears. 
But even this spot, which I believe to be the very finest as to fertility and diminutive beauty in this whole world, uh, do not like uh, for, like so well named as the spot I, I live on. I think nothing at all of, uh, uh, of it compared with the countryside where high downs prevail, with here and there large woods on the top side of the hill and where you see in the depths dells. Here and there farmhouses and here and there villages, buildings <coughs> sheltered by a group of, group of lofty trees. So he, lo he likes the rolling countryside, uh, is, is, is it, you know. Let me make a few com cute concluding uh, observations. Um, Cobbett was not uh, what we would quote a, a citizen of the world. It is quite enough uh, for me, he says, to think about what is best for England, Scotland and Ireland, although he fails to mention Wales. I don't know why. <laughs> Possessing a firm national identity, he criticised rival countries, warning that they should not swagger about or be saucy to England. Gosh, it seems sounds like a recent political statement. <laughs> I, I'll leave the audience to draw their contemporary parallels. <laughs> Cobbett made no secret of his opinions, but spoke at a time at, at times with excessive violence. And, and in many ways, it'd be no exaggeration to say he was a cross between Nigel Farage and Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> 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 it would be no. Uh, uh, I'll illustrate. He was addressing, albeit in a different historical context, issues on which both the right and left of politics are battling and are pining today. Depending on the issues, he would have sat very comfortably in either camp. But he was a good hater, for example, of the Corn Laws, paper money, he didn't like paper money. Uh, we, we see that today. But additionally, he didn't like uh, Peel, Wilberforce, Scotsman, he didn't like for some reason. <laughs> Methodists, Quakers, and U Unitarians, to whom he set a poser about sheep fluke. <laughs> uh, uh, it would be difficult to arrange all these in order of their offensiveness to him, so vehement was his language about it. He did not, did not mince his words about jolt heads at Westminster. Uh, so in his time, politicians were about as popular as they are today. Um, uh, 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 all, all the profligate London press. Chapman is described as a result of the lame and lazy, the gormandizing and guzzling, the bilious and nervous. And even on the subject of MPs, re rarely has so much been compressed into it. Uh, so few words as Cobbett's withering picture of Sir, Sir Francis Burdett. He is a sword to Westminster, a, a set fast on its black, a colic in its belly, a cramp in its limbs, a gag in its mouth. He is a nuisance, monstrous nuisance in Westminster, and he must be abated. <laughs> so Cobbett, uh, Cobbett's zeal, as he admitted when he supported government, often outrun his, ran his knowledge. He judged by first impressions, he did not, not bother to be consistent. Uh, he, he is logical, I suppose, within his prejudices. He, he had the largest share in making the public evidence, which uh, eventually got the case for uh, reform, particularly um, the electoral overwhelming. And in many cases, he was fighting quixotically against, unfortunately, the tide of events. The great web has not yet uh, been dispersed today. It crouches more ir irresistibly on the countryside. Factories have, despite Cobbett's displaced Mary England. <laughs> it was ironic uh, that uh, in the end he should represent, Parla uh, represent Oldham in Parliament, one of the most industrialised places in uh, the north of England at the time. But though he was often wrong and pig-headed, he was direct and honest. Throughout his life he hated affectation and corruption in any form, fr from ministerial sinecues to Gothic arches made of Scotch fir. He didn't like pine trees, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Must be deciduous. <laughs> he thought hypocrisy was a great sin of his age, and still continues. He worked hard and lived simply. In all his interests, ranging from grammar to morals, he showed keen observation and blunt common sense, as perhaps I've tried to illustrate on the agriculture and the countryside. But his, uh, his outburst should not make us blind to his essential cheerfulness and good nature. Whatever he did, he did, did it wholeheartedly. We may not share his interest in turnips, and he may rant and rail over much about the king's ministers, but in his, right, his writings of permanent appeal because it is sincere. It's a clear expression of strong and genuine feelings of a man alertly in touch with life around him. His prose, as I've said, is vi vivid and vigorous, and with always the fresh air of the atmosphere, one who loved to ride off early in the morning through the country lanes. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, so William Cobbett uh, knew the villages and the country estates that I've lived on. Were he riding around now, I like to think that he'd interview myself and my family. <laughs> <laughs> there are things that he'd recognise, love and a ball. Um, I think he would still see the aftershocks of agricultural revolution and enclosure as well. As tenants or workers with tired accommodation, my family and I have hopscotched along the West Barks and North Hampshire border within a, a small area, small radius. Some 17 years ago, we took up one short tenancy in a converted stable on the Ridgeway. It really was a converted <laughs> stable on the Ridgeway. Um, after a horse that my husband was working with kicked his hand and broke it, unable to work, he lost his job. Not long after that, I fell pregnant. Seeking some security, my husband took employment with a house as assistant groom at Highclere Stud. Highclere Castle and its estate was the home of Lord Porchester, then the seventh Earl of Carnarvon and the Queen's racing manager. So we are pre Downton Abbey. <laughs> I have a bit of an insight. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like just to read a bit about the description there that, I've, um, that is, forms a chapter in my book. Um, our cottage was secreted behind the high dome of Beacon Hill, down a narrow mile long drive. I lost my heart to it. One of a pair of traditional farm workers' cottages, it had a shared attic and a roof that sloped to the ground at the back like a sou'wester hat. This protected it from the elements, created shade for a cool pantry and a draw through the position of the door for the substantial fireplace. It was built like the badger set above it into a steeply wooded hill. We were never the only residents. Tiles overhung flint and cobshort walls, creating all sorts of crevices for insects and bats. It had a huge wood burning stove and needed it because you could poke your finger through the rotten window frames. Um, quite often, if I was hoovering out flies, the hoover nozzle would go through the window. Um, pre Downton Abbey. Um, and the old latch door was painted in layers and decades of estate blue, so you could get back to sort of all sort of different little bond books, like a farrow ball wall chart of, of paint, uh, but always blue. And it had a two inch gap along the bottom of the floor that the rain and the hail blew under. In unexpected snows, you'd get a drift instead of a dark draft excluder under the door. The outside was always expecting to come in. The valley widened out from the cottage into wildflower, herbal and medicine pastures for glossy, impeccably bred thoroughbred mares and foals that every turn looked like a, an Alfred Mullings painting. Lord Porchester was the queen, Queen's friend and racing manager, first-class breeder of horses and an expert on grasses and herbal lays, for those of you that have listened to the archers. Um, there were hares in the stallion paddock, barn owls in the haylofts, and in winter, even a stoat in ermine this far south. It was possible to hide from the world and belong to that just discernible rural past. There was still an old rhythm to the life, um, harvest suppers for the farm, and the stud being pasture, um, we, we were still buffered from the ill effects of pesticides and herbicides on the wildlife to a greater extent. With just half a day off a week, um, a whole day once a fortnight, and a bloody good reason to request a holiday, um, we, <laughs> we rarely went belong, be, beyond the estate gates. We were absolutely tied to the accommodation, our employer and the place. There was always mud um, in the house, the smell of boiled barley on the stove and straw on the floor, as a midwife visiting pointed out Riley. Um, <laughs> I was expecting our first child. Um, we felt, sometimes resentfully, um, part of the ghost of an old order of things. It was there when a low feudal mist cut us off from the outside world, um, when the Queen or wealthy Arabs visited, or when we were allowed to collect firewood, cut ourselves a Christmas tree, or accept a brace of pheasants from the gamekeeper. It was particularly present at Christmas, um, and when the seventh Earl died. We walked with other estate staff along the old Sunday church path through what was known as the wilderness, and up the mistletoe bauble to Lime Avenue, carrying our best shoes um, for drinks at the big house. <laughs> Um, in the library during the wake to celebrate the Seven Earls' life, um, my husband was a butt of jokes and spilt his drink on the podium's desk. <laughs> it was rather worse for wear. <laughs> um, but it was a close, insular time. Um, the past was tangible. And on windless days and nights when we, 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 we lived, the house was, I suppose, protected by the wooded coombe of the dam. It's in a slight coombe. And the beech trees all around it. It was very, very dark at night. Um, you couldn't hear a thing. Um, 
you could actually walk from, from the high level of the road down into your neighbour in the dark and not know they were there. Um, and you, you, I, I fancy that you could hear creaking of carts going up the roads or footsteps at night. It was, I felt quite comfortable, but I did feel that I was living with, with ghosts as well. Um, Cobbett hated the game preserves of grand estates such as Highclere and, and the Kirby estate which I now live on, and the privations caused by enclosure and land ownership, which in effect had made rural labourers slaves, denying them the sustaining traditions of gleaning, commoning, commoning um, gathering or poaching and working for a fair wage. He wrote to see for himself the lives of the common man, woman and child, avoiding the detested turnpikes and gentrified smooth roads. I, I encountered some of the smooth roads actually on my way to Reading. There were no potholes. Um, <laughs> he, he chronicled, wrote and harangued his way around his beloved countryside, acting as a kind of roving representative rallier and, and spokesperson of a changing English countryside, often sleeping on the road even into his 60s, and I've heard that he, he gave away whatever budget he had yeah, left that's up right. to yes, him. That's right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, as he rode through my home counties, Cobbett witnessed the more devastating effects of the agrarian revolution that I'd studied for O level history at school, giving away my age there. Um, even as he became an MP, he risked jail and deportation for his support and encouragement of the swing riots taking place at the time. Earlier, in the spring of 1795, the precursor of the welfare system was created in the ham hamlet of Spienland, which is just up the road from me, um, designed to provide relief to the rural poor after nationwide bread riots. But it didn't prevent some of the most violent activism, rick burning and machine breaking um, in the 1830s amongst local farms and estates where, where I live now. At secondary school in the 1980s, we learnt how many local rural families were sent to workhouses when their breadwinning men were deported for making a stand against the combined injustices of falling wages, tithes and new labour displacing machinery. We didn't know it at the time, but 100 year, 150 years on from that, the names of several families were changed or blocked out on our photocopied sheets lest anyone realise that the workhouse family shared the same surnames of children who now received a free school meals. I think that's quite remarkable. Yeah. Um, one, uh, William Winterbourne, was sentenced to death for his part in the riots and was pardoned in a local ceremony only last year from, I know, in a nearby village. He's a relative of the tractor driver um, who works in the farm estate where I live now. Um, I'm also, my other job is a school librarian in a, in a very small rural secondary school in Hungerford, we have a very mixed um, group. Hungerford, you might think, is a very wealthy, wealthy area. It's not, half of it is, half of it really isn't. Um, there are still students at the school I work at now that share those names and are still in receipt of free school meals now, which is quite shocking. Um, Cobbett described my beloved nearby Boomin Common, which I have been fenced out of in my lifetime, and actually it's been unfenced recently. <laughs> Um, we described it as a villainous tract of rascally heath, which I love. Yes. But he liked Highclere very much. In his journal entry from November the 2nd, 1821, he wrote, <coughs> This is, according to my fancy, the prettiest park I have ever seen. A great variety of hill and dell. I like this place better than Font Hill, Lenham or Stowe, or any other gentleman's grounds that I have seen. The great beauty of the place is the lofty downs, as steep in some places as the roof of a house. My house. Our horses beat up a score or two of, or a score or two of hares from the vale in the park along which we rode. We looked apparently almost perpendicularly up at the downs, where the trees have extended themselves of variously formed glades. These, which are always so beautiful in forests and parks, I'm echoing your quote, so, yeah. um, are peculiarly beautiful in this lofty situation, and with verges so smooth as that of these chalky downs. This is Thomas Hardy's Bear Hill. Um, Lord Carnarvon did not like Cobbett's politics, and, uh, <laughs> to say the least, and um, Cobbett was not impressed with um, Highclere Castle, with Carnarvon's castle. He said that the house I did not care about, though it appears large enough to hold a half a village. And I can testify to that as well. Um, just a note on wildlife. The, the, this is my, my real passion as well. The farm state and the dramatic chalk landscape I live on now, just a few miles along from, from Highclere, I was torn away from Highclere when my husband changed his job. We, we had four weeks to move out 
and I was expecting our second child in a week. It was quite a traumatic time. <laughs> um, but the, the, the estate I live on now is owned by the Astor family. Um, and the estate is my muse, it's, it's what I do most of my writing about. I also work on the estate seasonally and am chief agitator in its wildlife conservation plans, along with the gamekeeper. Now this is a tricky business. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, for every step the farm does for wildlife, it takes one uh, at least, or two steps backwards. Um, it's got me in trouble a few times. I write for the local newspaper, I write for the RSPB as well, and can't be too outspoken, or I risk losing my house, and the gamekeeper risks losing his house and his job. Um, and in effect, I risk being deported myself in, in modern terms, as we certainly could not afford the current rents for miles around. Um, I was kind of, it's still a lot to pay for a, for a cottage, but um, I certainly couldn't afford what the um, state agents are, are now charging locally. Um, farming has always been about change and improvement as much as, as it is about the things that stay constant. And I think Cobbett would certainly verify that. But at what cost? We're losing our wildlife now at a catastrophic rate. The State of Nature Report, which pulls data and expertise from over 50 um, nature conservation and research organisations, um, in 2013 it concluded that since 1970, the year of my birth, 56% uh, of our species are declining and some of those are heading fast towards extinction. Um, the UK is among the most nature depleted countries in the world. But the report cites policy-driven agricultural change as by far the most significant driver of these declines. Most of us want and need our wildlife and the freedom of the open countryside. But of course it must be a productive working countryside too, and as consumers we've got huge responsibility. But whose land is it? And who has the right to farm or manage the land to the detriment of its wild, historic inhabitants? Our farm and bird species, for example, are part of cultural literary heritage. You know, the skylarks that go back to John Clare and, and, and way back. Um, Nightingales, the wood behind my house is, is called Nightingales Wood. Hasn't been a nightingale heard in it for 30 years. Um, when I first moved in, the starlings and the thrush would still mimic nightingale song, um, which they must have learnt from the birds that had learnt it from the nightingales. Oh, absolutely heartbreaking. Um, turtle doves mentioned in the Bible, that goes back I think no much further, Chaucer. But too often we are fenced out and deterred. The crime of poaching has perhaps been replaced by trespass. We need and want the countryside for other purposes than just for food, and too often we're kept out. Um, I recently came across a map from around 1840, and the amount of common land on the estate I live on had actually increased from an earlier map for a while, it certainly hasn't now. Um, they are now, that, that particular area, it's chalk grassland. On Kirby Estate there, we have 90% of Berkshire's chalk grassland are actually on the estate. It's um, protected as a triple SI. Um, but it's very much up to the landowner whether they protect it or not. Um, Natural England haven't got the time to sort of send people out and be checking all the time. Um, and it's something I do, I do, I'm quite vocal about. Um, we, we've had some good changes lately with grazing regimes, which is, which is good news for the estate and its wildlife. Um, Cobbett often complained that country gentlemen were in control of the government of England, which of course they are to a large extent now. The arguments boiling over about grass, um, well, grass, grass moors is a case in point. Wildlife has been being denuded here for an expensive elite gentleman's country sport, and millions of pounds of taxpayers' money currently help shore this up. Pheasant shooting is not dissimilar. Our own shoot, which I do help out on, often uncomfortably, I have a, a difficult relationship with it, um, but it's a good one. Um, and it often makes more money than the farm. Um, yeah, yeah and, I mean, sort of, if, if you get a 350 bird day, so 350 pheasants would be shot, around about 40 pounds a bird, so you're looking at about 14,000 pounds for a great shooting. Um, grouse, I believe, are about 70 pounds. Um, just a note on, on the Great Wen as well. Um, my husband is now a paramedic. He went to, um, I think, his, one of, one of the, um, the first maternity jobs he had. He, he, he told the poor lady that <laughs> was in the back of the ambulance that his, his, um, he'd last, she said, have you done this before? He said, well, I have. 
but last time it was a foal. <laughs> um, he's, now, he's now a fully trained paramedic um, and a school librarian. I've got as many jobs as I've got children at the moment, and I've got three of those. <laughs> um, to live in the countryside and survive, you have to diversify, and I think you probably always have had to. Um, we don't own a house and aren't likely to be able to ever either. And if we were to lose our house tomorrow, and it does happen, it's happened to neighbours um, on this date, um, we could now not afford the rents demanded locally from many miles around. Uh, but increasingly, people coming into the area having sold properties in London, buying up the old farm workers and retired farm bungalows, knocking them down and building houses twice the size. Some of them are absolutely lovely people. They, they throw themselves into the village community and have become dear friends. Um, but others rarely send their children to the local schools or get involved in village life. Um, we have a lot of weekend um, second homeowners in the village too. Um, but what we don't get coming out of London is any of its wonderful cultural and ethnic diversity, and that is a terrible shame. Um, so to conclude, I think I, I would have loved to have met William Cobbett. It would have been a squeeze in our farm workers' cottage, <laughs> where my children shared a room, but we could of course accommodate his horse. Um, and I think he would have recognised much, he would have found a lot of things so familiar. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Commonality and contrast between your yes. two takes on Cobbett. I'm struck. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and make one observation, and maybe ask you to comment on that before I throw it open to the floor. But uh, um, the the allusion to uh, to Corbin and to Farage, and 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 then to your strength of voice in supporting local wildlife conservation and. Uh, that, that voice of the individual seems to be a, a commonality here, a point of commonality and connection. And it's certainly true of Cobbett as well, of course, because he was very vocal and very individual and certainly uh, very strong of opinion. And I wonder whether that feels like a point of connection for you both with Cobbett and whether you feel that that, that rise of the individual that we've seen in, in contemporary British politics uh, connects in some way those, those sort of those sort of strands that you see that link the past to the present. Do you want to go back? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think certainly for me, um, I, th I think my voice um, very much comes out in, in, in as a nature writer, and I think um, that the writing of uh, things that I'm lucky enough to be to have um, to be published as well, but also um, the, you know the ability anybody can write to put something out on Twitter on a blog. It does give you a voice. Um, so yeah, which, and, and I do feel that it's a, it's a voice that I didn't have before. I have um, I've protested, uh, was a protester at the Music Bypass, for example, um, and um, I didn't feel my voice was heard there. But actually, writing is is in many ways a political act. I think um, it's an act of remembrance as well, um, which again I think it was. Um, I just tried to remember who said it, but somebody it was either Robert McFarlane or possibly Mark Mark Becker. Uh, recently about um, writing being a, being a political act in, in that you're remembering as well, um, which is quite a powerful thing, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I agree entirely with your individuality. Cobbett was a great individualist. And we do seem to have uh, emerging, um, <coughs> perhaps because of events, much more uh, individualistic uh, writing and thoughts on, thoughts on things. I mean, some people denigrate them as... Uh, as, as one calls uh, protesters and so on, but uh, but no, there, 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 there is, I think, uh, it, it, in many ways, a lot more individualism, and of course, things like social media and so on do facilitate that. Interestingly enough, um, but no, I, I think we you know, we are we are seeing more of this, and I, I and and I think uh, we will we will see it in the context of agriculture and the countryside uh, over the next five to ten years as as you know, on the basis that the UK is leaving the e the EU, it, it, it will have to formulate its own agriculture and countryside um, uh, policies. And uh, I mean, you said Nicola, you've got you've got the balance between 
food production and trustees of the of the countryside of the farms and so on. It's a it's a it's a very difficult one to balance and get right. Questions or comments or thoughts from the floor? Are there any um, descendants of Cobbett? Um, not that not that I'm aware of. There is a Cobbett Society, interestingly enough, and um, I'm probably going to sort of send this to them. I probably be okay, but uh, um, but no, no, not no, not to my not to my knowledge. No. All these vocal ones. Of, um, in the contradictions, actually. Yes. In, in, um, I'm often very afraid of mentioning that um, I, I work on the estate um, as a beta, but I don't know if you know what I mean by that machine. Yes. Um, for me, um, I square it by knowing that the sheep does an awful lot for wildlife and the money from the sheep, a lot of it goes, goes to that. There are flocks of yellow hammers and minutes, minutes but they weren't there 10, 15 years ago. The gamekeeper is fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I think... But they, those birds are bred for that one reason, aren't they? They are. They're, it's, it's like a farm. It, it, it is, is a it farm. Is, yeah. and, and they are all, all dealt with. They're, they're all eaten. All, a lot of them are sent to Belgium, actually, if they're not eaten. We, we, we eat an awful lot of pheasant and partridge as well. It's kept us going in dark time. <laughs> um, but I think there's that contradiction. I, I, I remember the talk um, about John Clare. Yes. A while yes. Ago. Um, and I was relieved to find that actually, with, with John Clare, who was, who was very upset and, and actually probably quite unhinged by enclosure um, and the, the act of that, as, as I feel I have been as well, um, that he then had to go on and work for the enclosure gangs because that was employment in, in, his, um, in his village. So he was blowing up trees and he was cutting down hedges uh, for the enclosures to, to, take, to take place. So I kind of feel that actually not a lot of employment um, around where I am, if you're not working on the sheet or the farm um, or in the local pub, there's, there's not, my, my two children, my teenagers, um, two of my three children, um, yeah, they, they, are, they help out on the sheet as well, that's how they earn their money. Um, so I think basically what I'm saying, I'm, I'm just interested in the whole idea that the contradiction. Yes, I mean, in some ways he's sort of violent reactionary, um, he, he didn't like foreigners. Right. For uh, no, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's yes. not disguised, yes. right? He didn't like foreigners. He didn't want the world, the world to change. He thought the, the historic balance before the pressures of the Industrial Revolution, where he saw mutual benefits between you know, laborers, small farmers, and the la large landowners. Um, I think a little idealized. To, to, frankly, but he, he and also he uh, at, the, at the other end he um, you know self sufficiency. Uh, yes. you know, he, uh, those who um, those who are advocating self sufficiency today should actually read with read his book about that. Not a lot has changed. <laughs> <laughs> but but yet yeah, he, he was certainly a man of violent contradictions. I, I don't think he was aware that of that. Frankly, right. in his writing, that's my sense. He, uh, as I say, he was, uh, <coughs> he was logical and rational within his prejudices. Is the only way I can describe it. I mean, you've shown how um, themes have um, continued yes. similar themes from way back, probably before the Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so one can probably say these themes are going to continue in the future. I mean, there's always going to be yes. a move towards urbanisation from there. Yeah. Yes. People aren't going to yes. like it. Can you foresee a time when we will have what they call sustainability and, uh, and where we will be living a life where the population is not increasing all the time and there's ever increasing on that, ever increasing pressures on that? People were living a so-called ideal. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yes.
we've been going on. I don't, I don't know. I mean, we may, we may well be at, uh, you know, at a, at a crunch point um, with Brexit. Um, but also, I think, um, I think things will change. Um, you know, I, I'm probably coming from a different viewpoint, but I think the way people appreciate wildlife, um, people will start to say, look, this just isn't on. But not only that, I, I mean, I walked across um, a recently drilled field um, the other day, I'm making, remaking my path to, to do the horses. Um, and, um, and I picked it up, had it, some in my hand, and it was like apple crumble, it was wonderful, fine till. But in that, I dressed seeds. Um, and I'd watched the sprayer go round the day before, spraying the crop, spraying the, the, the ground, um, and I'd, it had already been sprayed off a couple of weeks ago um, to, to kill off any black grass or weeds. It was sprayed again. The seeds that are going into the soil are dressed with chemicals, and the, day, the next day the sprayer was round again as a pre-spraying, pre-emergent. And I think there's going to come a time when we're just going to say, look, this just we can't carry on like this. All these chemicals, what's it doing to us? What's it doing to our wildlife? Um, it, it's possibly more of a first world problem, I guess. You know, we can't all sort of be, be worried about our wildlife first. But I, I do, I do think we're going to come back. We're going to have to come back to that that idea of, of sustainability. Yeah. Um, I we, we do have pockets of sustainability in certain rural areas. Um, some of this, I think, is formulated by what I'll literally call incomers and second homers, mm. homers who, who perhaps are affluent enough to take that, uh, that, uh, that stance. Um, but I, I, I think it's going to take a very fundamental sort of event to, mm. to make us fully sustainable. I, 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 I mean, I'm cataclysmic, but you know, so, so, some, something it may be, it may be, for example, that I don't know, chemicals in food uh, bring about many, many more allergies than there are now. You, we've read recently about allergies, which seemingly, and I go back to my childhood, where there didn't seem to be those allergies al allergies around, or, or put, put it like this, uh, people, people seem to be able to live with them. So I, but but, but, but uh, I, I think the extensive processing uh, chemicals and so on uh, will ultimately be be the sort of factors which will which will pull us pull us to more sustainability. But I do, uh, I mean, uh, I do think Brexit and uh, having to formulate uh, the UK's own agricultural policy again, I think, does provide a point at which, uh, at least from a policy point of view, trying to get right that balance between what I'll call food production and trusteeship of the countryside. It, 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 it's an important marking point. I don't think it's, I don't think it's really, it's, I don't think it's quite registered with people. So you know, I, I, I quite enjoyed this, this event to get, to get that point, point over. Yes? I question whether allergies are the cause of the Uh, yeah. now, it takes a long time to diagnose. You've got cough, doctor, this, this, that, and the other. I mean, without, without conducting a sort of diagnosis, um, when, when, you, when, you were, when you were very young, were, were you aware of these? I always had stomach aches. Oh, I so see. did my mother, but she right. was never yeah. diagnosed. Yeah. Apparently, um, she came from the northeast of Scotland, yes. and apparently it's very, very common in the northeast of Scotland. Right. Yeah. But uh, that would yes. make uh, yeah. sustainability if it isn't diagnosed. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That That's an interesting observation. Thank you. Thank you. But I, but I think as well that the uh, you know I know I know scientists, um, but but the quality of our soil, um, the runoff, um, I, th I think I, I've heard you know that we we only really have actually got a few few harvests left before we, we come across huge problems. Yeah. Um, black grass is a, it's been a huge problem on our farm at the moment. Um, they can't kill it. 
They cannot yeah. actually get rid of it. There are no chemicals that will kill it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we just can't keep chucking things at the, at, you know, at, at the, um, we, we have to think of other, we have to broaden our knowledge, yeah. I think, on, on that, yeah. <laughs> that seems a, a very appropriate point to end, I think, given that Robert had talked about the potential role of the University of Reading in some of these conversations. We have a very big soil research project running at the moment um, and lots of work around climate smart agriculture and finding new ways to sort of move some of these conversations forward. But this has been a brilliant opportunity to have a little bit of a chat about the contemporary in relation to the yeah. giant looming figure of COVID <laughs> um, staring down from the past, no doubt judging us all for various reasons. My, my Scottishness being <laughs> one of those things. Um, but uh, thank you both, and uh, I hope you will come back and tell us more about the book. Thank um, you. And, and Robert, maybe we'll have you back post-Brexit to see how things have come back. No, no, be, 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 be delighted. Yes. Thank, so thank you very much. Thank you.